Welcome. My name is Yurich Reed, and I'm the director of the Southwest Harbor Public Library. I'm excited about this evening's event with Craig Kesselheim. We're also hopeful that this evening will help hearken a clear entry for spring. As those of you in the area can testify, spring has been coming in fits and starts. It was just a few weeks ago that I had 50 robins in the back of my yard. And yet this last weekend when I hiked up Homan's Trail, I was within three feet of three turkey vultures that almost refused to fly because of no prospects for thermals. A few pitches for our library service right now. Um, excuse me. Um, three, a uh, few pitches for library service right now. We're open for 15 minute browsing appointments and we continue to offer our curbside services. We also have one of the largest electronic um, collections of ebooks and audiobooks through our cloud library. And just make sure that your your library card is in good standing. Just you know, send us an email or call us to confirm what your address is and that it hasn't changed. And for those of you that don't have library cards with us, you can do that um, freely, um, remotely by giving us a call or emailing us. In two weeks, we will host locals John and Beth Sundberg as they give a travel log about their five day hike along Hadrian's Wall National Trail in England. You can register for the event directly from our website uh, probably within the next few days. For tonight's event, Craig will present for a bit under an hour. In the meantime, please use the chat feature and, and um, send questions. Our assistant director Kate Pickup McMullen, she will help facilitate our question and answer period. We're all very fortunate to have Craig Kesselheim active in our community. He's been an avid lifelong birder and an impactful educator in the roles of teacher, professor, and consultant. We've received you know, many compliments from his past presentations and we hope to hear your feedback after this one as well. We will be recording this event. It'll be available on our YouTube channel you know, within the next few days. Uh, collectively, our audience tonight is 100 strong, so please, together, let's warmly welcome Craig Kesselheim. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to this evening, and I'll uh, begin to share my uh, screen here now. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, I've, re I've really been looking forward to this evening. Um, probably prepared more than I needed to. It's not a um, international TED talk, but I love birds and I love um, sharing my passion and especially in this season um, to the best of my ability. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. Um, this picture is kind of my, my teaser. It's an incredible migration photograph, uh, quite a variety pack of spring warblers trapped uh, in, en route to Canada on a lighthouse about 12 miles off the coast of Maine, Machias Seal Island. Um, so this is actually kind of a, a spectacular event, but a rather dire event um, that is reflective of the perils of migration. I just wanna point out there's some warblers in the dark in the back right corner here on the superstructure of the lighthouse. These are birds who were trapped uh, while uh, in transit by, by weather. And I'll come back to them in a minute, but I just wanted to pull you in with a teaser here. Um, I, as Erich said, I'm a lifelong birder. I actually became a bird watcher in 1973 in uh, a course at College of the Atlantic. I was an early student at COA uh, in the 70s and I took a course on orn ornithology and it was truly a life changing experience for me. I've been a bird watcher ever since. And um, I have been on MDI for a, a large part of my life, but my wife and I lived in Wyoming for about a decade in the 1980s. Um, most of my birds are, are local, but um, I've been able to adventure a little bit around. And um, I live in Southwest Harbor. I have been preparing this talk at an entry level, but I, um, so it's kind of a blend of content and inspiration, um, graphics, entertainment. And I hope to make sure that it, it at a level that is informative and uh, but also welcoming to everybody. I wanna mention that 
Uh, many of the pictures are not mine, so I didn't really pitch this or create this as a as a picture show. It's more of an information talk with um, illustrations and graphics. And probably the best photographs are not my photographs. <laughs> I borrowed them from eBird and uh, Cornell and from a couple of folks who have um, just given me the favor of their photographs. So it's really, it's not a photo show, it's an informational one. And although migration is a very, very strong theme of spring birding and of this talk, I'm also want you to know that I'm not preparing a talk about migration. It's not a lecture or a, uh, an overview of uh, everything about migration, but spring is about, about new arrivals. And so migration is a strong thread throughout this evening. Um, I hope you will use the chat space generously starting now. Go find it on your toolbar down below if you haven't already. And um, let us know uh, where, you know, where you're joining from. It's kind of cool that the library by way of Zoom can include more people than would they would be able to fit in one room uh, in a live event and also from more locations than just uh, Mount Desert Island. So uh, sign in or say hey in the chat space. Uh, if you have any initial questions, Kate uh, will be the um, question monitor throughout the hour and I've invited her to in, um, kind of interject with a, with a timely question if one comes up and it seems really critical to the flow, but otherwise we're gonna to try to save minutes towards the end of the hour. And I'll also mention that I'm after we adjourn at 6.30, I'm happy to stay on for 15 minute, more minutes or so and just sort of have an open conversation with anybody who wants to stay and uh, linger and chat and, and pursue their questions. So uh, welcome aboard. And a final thought about the chat space. I know there are some folks in this, um, event with expertise. And if you see a question that's being posed in the chat space that you feel you can answer, um, I welcome that. So please feel free to, to participate uh, and share your wisdom uh, along with my slide deck. So I'll start by just mentioning that in the pandemic, there's been a, um, an exceptionally strong uptick in uh, interest in the outdoors. Even if it's interest in the outdoors through a window or through an urban uh, lens, there's a, a huge upswing in interest in bird watching, um, not to mention hiking, biking, uh, road trips, and uh, or RV camping, and all those kinds of things. So birding has um, is kind of a, a peaking even more than it already was, but it's a it's a passion that is growing um, nationally and internationally um, quite strongly. I created this slide just to kind of share with you the kinds of um, questions and factors that um, go through my mind when I'm walking and look and noticing birds. It's not, it's more than seeing the color pattern and saying that's a Baltimore Oriole. Um, my mind is kind of going through all kinds of um, elements or filters, like where am I? What's the habitat? What uh, behavior am, am I observing? What time of day? What time of year? Uh, is there a difference between male and female, either um, visually or behaviorally? Uh, do I see any uh, diet or eating behaviors, flight patterns, things of that kind? So there's a lot to birding, which it makes it enjoyable and challenging and a lifelong pursuit. Um, I'll also mention that uh, for me, when I talk to folks who are getting into birding, I have just a, a few basic recommendations or, or bits of experience I, I prefer to share. One is to simply get outside. I think we all know that. But even for me, when I leave my car, if I'm, if I'm watching birds from my car, if I step out of my car, inevitably I notice another bird or hear something that I wasn't able to hear from inside the car. Um, and that can be true for bird feeder watching. When you step outside, you notice more. Um, I would also offer that you know, even if you feel like you're a rank beginner bird watcher, you know more than you may think. You know a crow you know a robin, you know a Canada goose, you know a mallard. And these can be points of reference for comparison um, and uh, similarities. So similarities and differences, everything from behavior to colors to um, seasonal uh, associations. Be thinking about um, getting a decent pair of binoculars. Um, nobody, I don't think anybody becomes a lifelong birder with really crummy binoculars. You need something that's worth looking through um, and there are affordable binoculars. And I would also recommend 
of if you're if you're struggling to hear either birds or <laughs> your friends and family, uh, please look into hearing aids. I'm a proud wearer of hearing aids, and they've brought a whole lot of birds and joy back into my life. And um, they don't make you old anymore. Uh, I'm here to tell you. So also be thinking about you know a bird book that you like to use, an app that you hear about from others. Uh, I'm a big advocate of just pausing and noticing. Um, so my bird walks are not as aerobic as an exercise walk, but that's because I stop, I listen, I notice, I observe behavior al along the way. Um, birding can be social, so I recommend birding with others. There's a lot of joy in that, as well as a lot of um, peer learning. And take pictures and notes and, and capture audio with your, with your iPhone because they can help you um, kind of, you, you can use those as references or even you can send them to um, friends who are more expert than you uh, for some ID help. And be ready to fail because uh, that happens to me every week. You know, birding is humbling, but that makes it a lifelong pursuit and all the more challenging and fun. Uh, so I'll just offer this. Migration is a big part of spring, as I said, but it's also not limited to simply birds. And it is still a very active field for research. So some of the things we know about migration open up windows into more things that we don't know as well. Uh, so I'll just say that it's, a, uh, it's an active field of research and uh, fascinating and, and perplexing and not just limited to birds. So back to this uh, introductory photograph, this is just a slightly different view of the lighthouse keeper's porch and steps on Machaya Seal Island in the month of May about 10 years ago. This is uh, what, what birders call a fallout event. Um, it's when uh, mass migration of birds is halted, in this case by weather, probably fog and potentially headwinds. And these are the birds who are um, in kind of a desperate situation. I mean, they need food, they need rest. These are the survivors. There may have been many others who didn't make it to land, who may have perished in the ocean along the way. A lot of migration happens over open water uh, by birds who don't swim. And uh, so these are the survivors who are waiting for the break in the weather um, to, get th to get through to their breeding grounds. I also just wanna point out, just think about this throughout the evening and the presentation. If these organisms were as big as bison, or sandhill cranes, um, or wildebeest, every car in Maine would be pulled over to the side of the road and people would be gawking and taking pictures and saying, oh my goodness. So migration is, uh, bird migration is largely invisible to folks who kind of don't know that it's going on. And a lot of migrant migration happens at night, overnight. And so it's invisible in that way but uh, it's really a spectacular and very large scale event. And it happens twice a year. <laughs> so there we have a lot of opportunities to both experience it and learn about it um, throughout, throughout our lives. This is actually a, a, a slide that indicates how smart we are getting at, pr at predicting and tracking bird migration. This is a screenshot that I took from 1.30 this afternoon and it's a live um, migration map for today, for this afternoon, showing that birds are crossing the Gulf of Mexico and coming up through Central America and Mexico into uh, the heartland of, of the lower 48. And they're on their way here. And certainly, I think everybody on the call has probably seen migrants arriving already in your yard and in your, on your walks, but they're not here in the mass numbers that they're starting to arrive. So you see the lighter color is, uh, is down south and they're on their way. So um, getting into some of the kind of content of the, of the evening that I've prepared, I just wanna mention that this is perfectly timed for, my, for uh, spring birding because it's on. I mean, every day is a new, I kind of think of, of spring birding as, as 90 days of birthdays in a row. Um, any day can bring a, a lovely surprise, either a, an old pal like a robin uh, or a woodcock or a new surprise like an indigo bunting or a Baltimore Oriole. And every day of spring is a new chance to, to get out there and see something new. Um, the audible world becomes much more elaborate and enriching as well. Call notes that we've been hearing through the winter, even for our overwintering birds, become full-throated songs. So we start to really experience a playlist. Um, I wanted to mention too the scale of bird migration. This is a, a one window into just the numbers that we're talking about. 
these are birds that um, both in the fall and the spring, the fall is the orange arrows pointing southward that cross these two borders, the sort of the northern border of the US and the southern border of the US. And the, and the um, what would it be? Turquoise color is the northbound. And these are just literally birds that were counted by observers using radar. Um, and so there are many more birds uh, endeavoring to migrate both between these two lines, you know, some from south to north, uh, but not across the Canadian border, and also birds that were not counted. So it's a spectacular and huge event. I wanted to share a couple of numbers. This is a very tiny sample of numbers that are intriguing about, about birding in the springtime and about migration. Over time, uh, in the history of record keeping from the very earliest bird watchers on MDI, I would say European bird watchers anyway, um, the total species that have ever been recorded on MDI um, are roughly 345. And those are include a few like exceptional one of a kind rarities, but a lot of these are, are uh, dependable birds who come and go each year. Um, and if you were to, to bird watch for your whole lifetime and focus on Sertamont Springs, which is in Acadia, um, you might see over those years and over multiple visits, 175 of the 345 reported for MDI. Um, but to look at a January typical list, you might see 18. And that would be a good day <laughs> in January. And an incredible day in May might be 80 or 90 species, probably not 126. But in the month of May, just as Sertamont, there are 126 species that have been recorded there over time. So um, spring is an incredible um, moment of arrivals uh, spread across about three months with just new colors, new songs, and a lot of diversity. And one other number that I'm just personally picking, it's not even a main bird, but it's a spectacular um, uh, long distance athlete, if you want to think of it that way. This bird in the lower right corner flies nonstop in the fall from Alaska to Australasia, so it could be New Zealand or other places uh, in that region of the Southern Pacific, um, one way for seven days without stopping. This is a bird that does not swim and it cannot stop to eat. It can't sleep in a traditional sense and it can't drink water for seven days uh, with no refueling. Um, so we think we've got it tough when we're running a marathon or a half marathon. This bird is incredible. And it does this twice a year, of course, southbound in the fall and northbound in the spring. And it might live 20 to 25 years. So a phenomenal, just awe-inspiring um, kind of a phenomenon that is migration. I want to also share a little bit about how I personally pivot towards spring as a bird watcher. And I also want to give a shout out to my good friend, Reed, who built this birdhouse. This is down in Cape Elizabeth, expressly to attract Baltimore Orioles. I think Reed could uh, do well if he quit his day job and marketed these, um, but I'll leave that to him. This is an Oriole feeder that he put out uh, probably early May is my guess, because that's um, the month of May is when I think of as Baltimore Oriole time. So here are some things that happened for me as a bird watcher as March uh, comes in and progresses into April and, and May and June. I become a bird watcher who um, visits a lot more places. So in the wintertime, I tend to be a, a feeder watcher, my feeding station, my bird feeding station. And most of the birds that I see and seek are on the shorelines. That We have an incredible variety pack of water birds, uh, loons and ducks and grebes and guillemots um, that are here in the winter because most of their freshwater habitat is frozen solid. Um, so I walk the shorelines. But now, uh, as spring progresses, every habitat is a potential um, bird bonanza. My ears are very active, uh, hearing aids and all, uh, in the springtime. And many times I take a bird walk and I record birds that I, 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 I like I, I write down birds that I have seen, um, sometimes just by ear. I've, I've located them and I've, I've named them just audibly without stopping to look at them, like a blue jay or a cardinal or a crow. I won't necessarily pursue all of those with binoculars. So we get these little call notes through the winter time but suddenly the Cardinal or the Junko are singing full-throated songs. Another um, habit of mine that is not so important in the winter time, but it's very important in the spring and summer is that mornings matter. Migration, as I said, happens uh, under cover of darkness for most uh, perching birds. 
uh, and many others as well. And so you can count on overnight arrivals and you can also count on birds being hungry either from their overnight flight or just from an overnight of fasting. And so there's a lot of feeding going on in mornings. Um, over time, not just in one year, but over time, you also learn the chronology, the rough kind of arrival dates of birds across the spring calendar. I'm not looking for Baltimore Orioles now, but I will be in May, for example. But I'd be surprised if I never heard a, an American woodcock in March because that's when I count on them on them arriving. So learning that chronology is kind of like, you know, like stacking your calendar for the things you want to go watch um, and, and anticipate. Um, and this is a bit of a joke. Take the binoculars. I pretty much take my binoculars even down to the post office in the springtime because you never know what might fly by or, or uh, uh, crop up. So uh, take your binoculars everywhere, even if you don't think you're going to use them. And then be ready to change your feeding station menu. Uh, be ready for the hummingbirds and be ready for the, uh, for the or Orioles and others. And if you have any other uh, behaviors or, or new habits that you pick up in spring, um, so I'd be interested in you adding in the chat box what your pivots are, um, like what's new for you in the springtime as a bird watcher or a nature uh, enthusiast. So feel free to add that to the chat space because I'd love to look in later. Um, so a couple of thoughts about spring migration that I wanted to kind of um, highlight. One is that um, we, don't, we don't need to expect all birds to migrate to be long distance athletes. Some migrations are quite short, others are medium and others are long. We have local birds that are here with us year round who um, change their behaviors in springtime. So this is a sort of a non-migration note here that uh, they, but they refocus and relocate. And then we, we also have birds that are here year round, perhaps in smaller numbers, but they can also be migrants. So blue jays migrate, um, not in great numbers and not every one of them, but some blue jays migrate. Uh, cardinals migrate, even though we may see them through the winter. Mallards migrate, <laughs> even though we see a lot of them all winter long. Um, so I wanna just give you a couple of samples of species uh, to kind of like, build some insights about, about spring arrivals and spring birding. Here's an American robin, and here's the range map that I picked up off of uh, uh, Birds of the World. The orange is where robins breed only. The purple is where we see them any time of year, winter and spring and summer. And then the blue uh, are the places where it might extend its southern range, uh, but not breed. So I just want to give a shout out to the robin. It's a hardier bird than, than many of us may realize. Uh, way up north of the Arctic Circle, they nest on open ground. There are no trees, so they're ground nesters and they're, they're pretty hardy. They can handle a lot of rugged weather um, and a lot of tough conditions. Uh, but I also want to point out that they're very close to us in Maine. In fact, if you, if you can see close enough on this purple um, zone in the map, they're really here all year round. Um, here's a, a distribution map of, of the frequency of observations of American robins. The far left uh, of the lower axis is January 1st and the far right is December 30th. And the frequency of uh, observers who record robins on their bird walks picks up significantly in March, as you can see, there's a really steep climb, but they never really quite go away, do they? I mean, there are some hardy ones who uh, find uh, berries and other food to eat through the winter. And every Christmas bird count on MDI and in the surrounding areas, other bird counts nearby, have one or many robins depending upon the year. So they never quite go away. Here's an Eastern bluebird, another actually surprisingly hardy bird as, as fragile as they may appear. These are related to robins actually. They're in the robin and thrush family. And um, you can see if you can look closely at the coast of Maine, there's a line of purple that goes up to south coastal Maine. Uh, Cape Elizabeth, for example, would be a place where you'd see robins all winter long. And on exceptionally cold nights, they might kind of form a pig pile in a birdhouse and, and six or seven birds might actually enter a birdhouse to stay warm and share body heat overnight, but they're never far away, um, even in the depths of winter. And here's a frequency chart across the calendar year from January on the left through December on the right of bluebird sightings just for Hancock County. So you see they're, they're, they're really scarce in January and in February. 
but they pick up and uh, stay with us through the fall and then they kind of dwindle and leave in, in scattered numbers uh, well into the winter. So that's kind of an interesting note about why we see bluebirds earlier than we might see some other individuals uh, species. The common eider is one of our, I would propose one of our favorite birds because it's a local. Um, we see them all year round. It's the only sea duck that also that we see in the winter, but also breeds in the summer. They breed in places like Great Duck and Little Duck Island and um, other coastal islands along the coast of Maine. But they also, if you can follow the orange um, zone on this uh, global map, you can see they also migrate in pretty big numbers up to the far north where they can't spend the winter. Um, so our local bird, the eider, which, and we see their chicks along the shoreline uh, in, um, I think it's June, it might be July, but I think it's June. We see uh, females with these clusters of chicks um, swimming along the shoreline and trying to keep an, an eye peeled for bald eagles uh, and other flyovers. So of interest, um, what date is this? So Sunday, two days ago, Jerry Smith, a friend of mine, and some of you may actually know him, he spent some time here on MDI. He lives in Orrington now, and he reported 120 common eider um, flying overhead in Orrington, Maine. So these are clearly migrants, and they're flying up the Penobscot River uh, wa uh, watershed, perhaps towards the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, they also might encounter such icy conditions up in the far north that they decided to turn around and try again in a week. Um, and of interest as well, 11 years ago, this is my observation, almost to the day, it was like yesterday, 11 years ago, I was driving across 395 over the Penobscot River and I saw a flock that I estimated to be 200 in size of common eider flying north. So it's just these cool moments of opportunity that um, bird watchers get to witness, uh, to witness migration. And then an interesting and different example of a migrant who we do enjoy here on MDI in places like um, the Rockefeller Fields on Norway Drive and um, the Mud Creek Road over in Lemoyne. This is a bird that has a very, very long distance to travel before it gets to its breeding grounds uh, in these pastures on MDI and elsewhere in Maine and New England. It's a bobolink, it's a member of the blackbird family. Uh, females and males are both beautiful in their own right uh, and very different and distinctive in their own right. But you see, uh, they've got a lot of uh, territory to cover and I would say also a lot of different conservation practices to endure, uh, perhaps even hunting uh, or trapping or environmental toxins en route. And then they get here and they, um, they nest in places that we also like to mow and harvest hay in. So they've got a tough road to hoe. Um, but let's look at the arrival map here. So, so different from the, the robin and the bluebird because this bird can't just come up on a sunny warm day the way the robins might arrive when we get two days of, of warm weather, suddenly we get a pile of robins in our backyard. The bobolinks are traveling. And when they're here, suddenly they're all here. Like May 1st, they all got here. Um, and then they dwindle off, you know, as they, as they raise their young and flock up and, and, and kind of move their way south. But they are fully gone basically by the middle of September. And we will not see them again. Uh, until next May. So enjoy them while we have them, but a very different um, arrival and migration story. So I think of migration, this is not a scientific talk, but so this is just Craig's view of, of what's happening in our world as um, for locally to Mount Desert Island, I think of it as who's leaving us, who's coming but not staying for, for long, and who's arriving to stick around and, and raise some young. Uh, and then in the springtime, there's always the birthday party factor, which is uh, which crazy bird is going to lose its direction and, and land here and uh, make all the bird watchers happy um, in springtime. So springtime can be an incredible event for, for vagrants and, and crazy arrivals. And there are obviously some influences, especially for um, migrants who are en route. Weather can be uh, an enhancement, like the um, good winds, good wind direction. Uh, lack of precipitation, clear skies at night, that kind of thing. And there can be weather like we saw in the very first slide that can completely stall or block progress. So weather's an influence. Day length is one of the unknown uh, uh, triggers for migration in the first place. It's called photoperiod. So birds that migrate are often, um, or, or even stop 
doing their call note and begin to sing, they're often doing that because of um, day length as a trigger. It's a hormonal trigger as well as a behavioral trigger. And then over time, climate is an interesting factor. I wanted to share a couple of examples that exemplify that. Um, we never used to have cardinals in Maine, much as that might be surprising um, when you look out your window, both winter and summer now, but they didn't arrive in Maine until 1969, and they made their way uh, in the 50s through Massachusetts and in the 60s through, the, through Vermont. So bird ranges are often um, kind of a movable picture and a changing story. A blue grain gnat catcher is not a bird that we see very often. It would be a great day what, to see a blue grain gnat catcher here on Mount Desert Island. And we do see them, but it's unusual. But I wanted to point out that their ranges are expanding similarly to the Cardinals from the six, 1960 to 1980. 1980 looks like maybe around Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And then um, the most recent date uh, stamp here, 2000, looks to be about mid coast. So uh, ranges change, especially enhanced by climate. Here's some of the birds we are saying goodbye to. And I just wanted to point them out because we enjoy the company of birds that are here, I would say on purpose um, and not by accident in the winter time. We have snow buddings uh, infrequently, but in a lovely, you know, it's a lovely moment when you see them on the roadside or at seawall or on a ball field. Um, uh, they're a very hardy, high Arctic breeder, like well north of the tree line up in the tundra. Um, but they come down here in the winter time and they kind of move around uh, um, um, as habitats and food supplies allow. The American tree sparrow um, on the upper right is a lovely little sparrow that winters here on purpose. So I have a neighbor across the street who gets five in a hedge and a fence, a beautifully vegetated kind of dense um, patch of, of habitat for the American tree sparrow. And I get never get them on any day in the winter in my open yard and feeding station, but they're about 100 yards away all winter long. They're leaving us. The evening gross beak is getting scarce, but they we think of them as a winter bird. Uh, they go to the interior Maine and further north in the summertime for breeding. And the common red bull, which is a lovely little finch and one of the hardiest birds um, equal to or hardier still than the snow bunting, they, they can breed in the high, high Arctic. And on a lucky day, we see common red poles here um, on Mount Desert Island in the, in the depths of winter time. All right, what's next? So we're also losing uh, many of our sea ducks and, and ocean birds because they breed in fresh water and um, that's frozen in the winter. So they, they winter on, in the case of the long-tailed duck, the Pacific coast, as well as the um, Atlantic coast. You can see a very thin, thin line of blue on this range map, which is their winter habitat. It goes up the St. Lawrence a bit and around uh, Newfoundland. But then when they do migrate, you see they have to travel both uh, north and uh, west to get to their destination. But it's a beautiful bird. We're already seeing them leave. There are probably uh, quite a few that are still lingering, but they won't be here for long. Next up is the cormorant exchange. We have a few uh, great cormorants all winter long, and they're here in their winter range. It's a larger cormorant. On a good day, you can see this white patch on the throat and potentially even the white flanks on the upper leg. Um, but uh, it's, it's less frequent. You can see a few on old soaker off of Stan Beach. And uh, I always can count on a few on a reef pole off of Seawall picnic area. But they are leaving soon and they'll be replaced by double crested cormorants by the thousands who are coming to Maine. And interestingly, today, I got a, a Hancock County bird alert today. Today is the first day that folks have been reporting double crested cormorants from Ocean Drive. Um, I think it was a flock of about 33 and there's more behind them. They sometimes fly in Vs, which can initially make you think you're looking at a line of Canada geese. We have a horned grebe, which um, is kind of duck-like, but it's not a duck. It's an ocean bird when it's with us. You can see it's um, blue range on the Atlantic coastline and interior um, south where it doesn't uh, freeze. And you can see it on the Pacific coast as well. But when they leave us here, they get dressed up for Canada and they also fly pretty far west to get to their breeding grounds. So the horned grebe is leaving us. A pass through, here's a northern gannet. Um, you can see this tiny inset in the lower right corner is its range map for breeding. The um, sort of salmon color areas where uh, there are huge breeding colonies. 
Um, and it's a spectacular bird. We call this kind of bird pelagic because it really never touches hard ground unless it's breeding. So every kind of weather condition and every other life need happens in the open ocean um, for this bird. It's spectacular. We can sometimes see it when the storms are kind of blowing inland. We can see it from seawall and ocean drive and Scudic Point. Um, it's got a six foot wingspan. It dives uh, dramatically from very high heights directly into the water head first and catches fish. Um, but we won't be seeing it for long if we get lucky and see it at all. Also, uh, many shorebirds come and go through Maine. This is a greater yellow legs, but there are many who kind of like look like this body plan. They might be smaller, uh, they might be larger, their bill might be shorter or thicker, um, and their legs might be yellow or, or brown, <laughs> but um, basically, you know, our sandpipers. And many of them breed either in the, the um, taiga, the, the forested north of Canada, or beyond that in the open tundra. Um, and so they're migrants that we will see, but not for long. And interestingly, shorebirds are some of the earliest southbound migrants. Just when we think we're getting through with, with spring migration, we start seeing some uh, shorebirds heading south. As early as July 4th, we get, uh, we get uh, fall migration happening with shorebirds. And then I just wanted to point out a couple of really interesting, um, I, I guess you could call them pass-throughs, but they aren't going far. Um, here's an indigo bunting. This is my um, fairly basic feeding station just outside my window, uh, my kitchen window. And last spring we got a lucky and we had a couple of indigo buntings. These are males, colorful males, um, eating our seeds. But um, they're not here in July. So the right hand picture is a map of eBird sightings. These are individuals who reported their observations by eBird. Um, and they're not in the circle that includes MDI, but they aren't far. So I've, I've seen them um, in Essex Woods in Bangor, but I haven't seen them on MDI in July. Similarly, Baltimore Oriole, they're here in Maine, but they're not here on MDI in July. So we get to enjoy them in May as pass-throughs. And that's when we put out uh, the split orange uh, feeder on the feeding station or stick it on a pole or something like that to invite them in. They're pretty good at, at seeing them on a flyby. And then the fox sparrow, this is a very large, almost reddish, beautiful sparrow that um, it comes through here. It's kind of like here now if it's, if it's still around and it's on its way north. So it's a very early northbound migrant going to interior Maine and well, well up into Canada uh, for breeding. And I'm going to play the first audio clip of the fox sparrow here because often I record a, a fox sparrow on an eBird list of mine having never physically located the bird. It has a very distinctive rolling song that I'm going to play for you right now. So if my neighbor Jeannie is the lucky one who gets a fox sparrow, I might hear it from her feeding station um, and hope to sneak over there and see it, or I may not see it, but um, bird identification can happen uh, just audibly if you, with practice. I wanna give a shout out to a truly phenomenal uh, migration event that happened uh, in Quebec a couple of years back where six bird watchers intentionally went to a place that they knew a lot of migrants would be passing by and captured this phenomenal event. And this kind of harkens back to what I was saying about bison and, and um, sandhill cranes. The enormity of numbers is just mind boggling. Even though we have a, a global decline in birds and bird uh, numbers, migration is still an incredibly high volume event and truly spectacular. And these um, fairly expert birders went up intending to capture as much as they could in one day. So here's their eBird list. I pointed out a couple of features here. There's six individuals uh, here who are uh, spending almost 10 hours nonstop birding at this location. They don't travel much at all. And um, they record overall the whole day, 108 different bird species. And their estimated count of individuals is nearly three quarters of a million individual birds, just mind boggling. And frankly, a little bit intimidating to think about the job that this day was. Um, so they ended up uh, using algorithms and estimation techniques to figure out how many of each bird they think they saw and they got as close as they could using these algorithms. But just one example, truly mind boggling, the bay-breasted warbler, their estimated count for bay-breasted warblers in one day 
is 144,300 individual bay-breasted warbler birds flying over in late May towards the boreal forest of Canada. Uh, incredible and exciting. Um, the American woodcock is one of our early arrivals. So we're transitioning now from passing through to birds that are coming here to stay. And um, it's one of the most entertaining uh, shorebirds or birds of any kind that uh, I can think of. They arrive uh, early in, in March. They're one of my trigger birds that tells me spring is here. When the grass is still brown and the mud is still pretty yucky, um, they're here getting ready to set up their territory. And they have two songs, uh, two vocalizations that I'm going to share with you here. One is this very comical peent sound, and another is a song flight that is enhanced by highly adapted uh, primary wing feathers that whistle on this circulating, uh, circling descent. Uh, so I'm going to play it. It's going to last about a minute all told. You're going to hear the painting and then you're going to hear the song flight. And this happens in your backyard or very close to your backyard all over MDI um, in the month of March um, in the dusky hours just before dark and in the dusky hours just before daylight. Okay, first here's the paint. Circling overhead in the dusk. Starting to descend. Feel the urgency. Closer to the ground. If that doesn't make you a bird watcher, I don't know what will. I mean, and this happens literally in your backyard or very close to your backyard. Alder thickets, um, wooded areas, marshy places, all over Mount Desert Island in the month of March, and um, it's a comical bird, but it's a it's a powerful example of a highly adapted. It's a kind of a sandpiper that never hits the shoreline. It's really goes for mucky marshes. Um, also, the spotted sandpiper on our coastline is a beautiful kind of tail pumping um, sandpiper who um, they nest north of here, but they also nest here like on the shorelines of Frenchman Bay Islands and elsewhere. Just a quick uh, kind of insight into migration monitoring. These are eBird records from individual people who submit their daily observations by eBird. The upper left corner is March 12th. The lower right corner is one day later for American Woodcock and that's this spring. I captured these screenshots one day after the other. So you can tell they're arriving and here's um, four days after that that are here, <laughs> it's just like, boom, woodcocks. So um, it's a really cool thing to, to be able to monitor and it's an early treat uh, for a long drawn out migration season. A couple of the birds I just wanna celebrate our backyard lovelies here, a great catbird, this one carrying a stick, probably a foundational stick for a nest before the finer stuff gets built in. Um, common backyard bird, a lovely songster with a meow kind of a, uh, call note and many other vocalizations. The Eastern Phoebe is a lovely flycatcher perching high on garden poles and low branches, nesting in our eaves of many uh, human-made structures and saying its own name uh, as it sings, Phoebe. So it's named for its call. Canada geese, increasingly a nester here. Um, uh, too many locations to name, but they kind of arrive in numbers and then separate into pairs and find somewhat quiet places uh, to raise their young. And then they congregate after the young have hatched in places like Babson Creek and Bass Harbor Marsh um, and, Sir, and Great Meadow over by Sir Lamont. Uh, Song Sparrow, very common, uh, fairly lovely sparrow, uh, sings in probably every yard of people who in Maine who are joining this call tonight and a, and a bird that uh, deserves to be known just simply because it's so common. 
Pardon me, um, Craig. I've yeah. got a question about American woodcock. Yeah. Uh, and it was song flight or wing noise. Does that happen only when ascending in flight? California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I believe the the sound is mostly in flight, and m most of the sound we heard was circling overhead and then descending. Um, and it kind of like breaks the wind with its um, wings, which separates the primary feathers and, and makes that whistling sound. The primary feathers are highly adapted to make the, the wind whistle. I'm not sure if I answered that question fully. Apparently, um, according to this person, California has doves which do the similar thing. Oh, something. Cool. Mm -hmm. And there is another question about where robins are in winter. Yeah. Just I don't know if you've addressed that. Sure. Um, Thanks. Robins are, robins are um, sometimes hard to find, and you might spend a whole winter never seeing one, but they tend to find um, thickets with uh, leftover berries. So choke cherries, um, crab apples, uh, old apples, and abandoned um, apple trees within the park and elsewhere. And they move around from location to location um, throughout the winter. So they aren't necessarily stuck in one place. But if there's a good feeding spot, uh, without a whole lot of harassment going on, you might see several. Um, but again, they, they're spotty in, lo, in, a, in their location, but when they find food, they stick with it and uh, inevitably some, some winter over. Uh, but Thank you. It's, it's pretty common not to see a robin if, you know, unless you're really uh, traveling across the whole island, like on a Christmas bird count day, that kind of thing. So a quick shout out to a couple of favorites. Uh, both of these are recovery success stories from days of uh, heavier pollution. The osprey, which is about to arrive, but not here yet. And the peregrine, which has gotten here and is set up setting up territory in these three locations and the trail closures as probably the locals know have already happened. Um, I'm gonna just, I'm watching my time and I'm gonna try to um, get through these relatively quickly, but just mentioning that there are locals who change their behaviors like the mallard. We see them in large uh, gregarious flocks. They're now paired off and trying to hide, basically finding a quiet place to nest where they won't be disturbed. And so suddenly on a walk that, where you're used to seeing sometimes hundreds of mallards, you're seeing none, uh, but you're walking by a marsh and you might startle a pair. The dark-eyed junco leaves our feeder and goes to a forest. I think of this as a, at least some individuals are very short distance migrants. They leave my feeding station and go into the forest nearby and sing from a spruce tree. Um, and then a winter feeding group of these four species, um, often on, on hikes and walks around MDI, when you see one of these species like the chickadee, if you pause and wait and listen, you'll also see these three others. They tend to form feeding flocks and travel through the woods on feeding pathways all winter long. But right about now, they're breaking up, pairing off and, and forming nesting territories. So here's the mallard. Again, a hardier bird than we might um, expect or respect. Um, they're here all year round, but they're not in Northern Canada or Greenland all year round. So they are migrants, but for us, they're locals. Here's a Solmesville uh, wintertime scene, mostly mallards, probably a few American black ducks blended in. And uh, in fact, I see a couple and then some hybrids because these two ducks uh, interbreed. So you probably have a couple of mutts in there, here and there. And here's what, um, your encounter with mallards would look like. This was taken on a walk on the seawall shoreline about a week ago. Um, and here's a pair of male and female trying very hard to be obscure. Uh, and then later on in the summer, mom's taken over and this is over at Cousins Creek near Bernard. And um, this, her job is to, is to take this flock and, and keep it uh, from diminished, being diminished too much by predators uh, and letting them uh, grow up into the next population of mallards. Our favorite loon has uh, begun to leave the ocean. I saw my first pair on Echo Lake last week. They look like this in the wintertime and they are numerous all around our shoreline. Uh, they've, they've been transitioning to this checkerboard pattern on the back and the beginnings of a necklace. And obviously soon they'll be looking like this. Um, and then later in the summer, they'll have chicks uh, if all things go well. All right, a couple of uh, call outs to audibles because I promise this, and I also um, maintain that um, anybody who is a regular bird watcher becomes more and more uh, aware that birding is audible as well as visual. Um, many bird walks are majority audible birds and minority visual birds, depending upon um, you know, your, your time frame and, and your skill at, at picking out birds by song. So let's play the Cardinal song. Um, 
we see the both the male and the female, uh, each lovely in their own way. So here's the male song, I mean, the, the cardinal song. Crow in the background. One of the first songs of spring that I hear out my uh, window when I go down the driveway or out my door when I go down the driveway to get the paper. Uh, it's easily a March, early March song, sometimes late February. But all winter long, here's the call note we hear. We just get that. And you can learn your call notes. It takes a little longer. But, and that one's, that one's learnable and it's different from others, but uh, it's delightful to hear the first one in song. Here's another song I wanted to share with you. This Swainson's thrush is related to robins and bluebirds, and it's a little more obscure than the hermit thrush, which we'll play next, um, and a little harder to find on MDI. You can find them on the Western Mountain Roads. I've, I've seen them and heard them on the Bass Harbor Headlight Road, uh, and I know there's many locations on the Bar Harbor side of MDI where you can also hear them. But thrushes are known for their fluty songs. This one starts low and kind of warbles or gurgles upward. So I want you to notice the, the upward trend of this fluty song. There was a morning dove right there too. Sort of growly and then rising up. Beautiful, beautiful fluty song. All right, one more. This is a duet here that I captured with my simple little iPhone. It's a hermit thrush, a bird with a red tail compared to the olive-backed bird that we saw um, in the Swainson's thrush in the slide before. And this is sort of the, the typical Northwoods song that we think of um, as true summer in Maine, along with a white-throated sparrow and the common loon. But here's a hermit thrush interspersed with a swamp sparrow, a lovely uh, bird that's pretty um, secretive in marshes all over MDI and you'll hear it trilling in the sort of overlapping with the fluty hermit thrush song. Here we go. That trill is the swamp sparrow. Red squirrel. Hermit thrush. Hermit again. And the swamp. All right, I'm just going to do a quick um, kind of a showcase of warblers. I'm, I'm noticing that I'm, I'm using up nearly the whole hour, and I apologize for that but I will linger after our hour is over for Q&A. Um, these warblers travel long distance. They're tiny little uh, gems. And when people who aren't bird watchers tell me they saw a bald eagle and how exciting it was, I celebrate their bald eagle and I want to say to them, there is so much more like this guy, um, male and female American red start, like these guys, the Perula warbler, like this, the Magnolia warbler. And they're everywhere on MDI in the springtime. A lot of birders who come to Maine come for those, the, uh, the warblers. Spectacular black Bernian warbler. Yellow warbler all over the place in willow um, um, thickets and elsewhere. Chestnut-sided warbler. I think of this as a Cape Road and Seal Cove bird, but um, elsewhere on the island like Surtamont in great numbers. Uh, final thoughts are, I, um, this, I'm not going to read this, but I just wanted to share that as a birder, one of the things that I do is I think about, it's the month of March, where am I going to go birding? Those are the locations on the left that I often go birding in the, mar in the month of March. And what do I expect to see? So this is more mental than, than paper and pencil, but I, I think of my March locations and I think of my March probable we'll see kind of birds. And I do the same for the month of April which shifts a little bit. So new birds arrive and new places uh, to go on my outings. So my final recommendations are to find your favorite field guide. There are many. I'm happy to follow up with anybody uh, and, and show a couple or talk about them. Uh, find an app or two. Merlin is a great app for um, your phone. Take it out in the field and listen to bird songs in real time. Uh, find a podcast and learn more. 
listen to dawn choruses and just enjoy the aesthetic pleasure of bird songs. Become an online birder with eBird. It's a, and there's no paywall and there's no skill level requirement uh, to start recording your observations. However simple they may be, they all matter. Um, bookmark allaboutbirds.org because it's a great free site for identification background. It's kind of like a field guide on the web. Um, and then start attending events like the Acadia, Acadia Birding Festival, which is really happening this spring here on MDI. Uh, become a member of Down East Audubon. They get lead great field trips. A couple of my favorite books, the field guide in the middle is Sibley's. Uh, he also wrote a more of sort of a biology and natural history book that came out quite recently, what it's like to be a bird and a screenshot of the Merlin app that I have on my phone. Um, here's all about birds, uh, a search bar where you can look up any species you're interested about, but you could also listen to their songs like the woodcock that I played you a while back. And if you, if you do nothing else with the Acadia Birding Festival. I do hope you register and join some of the walks uh, this, that are happening this spring. Um, go to the website and go and look up their trip descriptions because every place that has a star here on MDI is described from where to park to what to expect on a spring bird walk. So it's a spectacular um, guide to bird watching in Maine, what to see and expect. Uh, Down East Audubon, a great organization. They lead wonderful field trips. And uh, final notes about numbers. You, we all know that birds are in serious decline. It's a tragedy that's happening that um, we do have some agency about one thing. And I'll apologize if you're a cat owner, but I feel strongly about keeping cats um, from killing our birds. Think about the long migration effort that birds endeavor. Um, they get to a site, they build a nest, they find a mate, they lay an egg, and then your cat eats them. Um, so be mindful about um, how your cat might be impacting, whether it's visible to you or not, uh, the wild bird population of Maine. Think about plantings around your yard. It's not only visually pretty, but um, they host insects and birds uh, and are beneficial in that way. Uh, Maine Audubon has a great website for supporting native, span, uh, native plant um, plantings and shade grown coffee supports uh, habitats in birds wintering grounds that are beneficial to their survival in the winter when we don't have them. Um, here's a slide about becoming an eBirder. They have a kind of an online tutorial that's super easy and user friendly uh, that gets you uh, recording your birds. And it's an open database that is amazing and it's global. It's really, really powerful. All right, um, I perched under this statue of a bald eagle at Montezuma National Wildlife in New York. Uh, state last fall, and this is my cue for seeing what kinds of questions you may have. And again, I apologize for um, taking essentially the full hour, but I'm more than happy to, and I'm going to stop screen sharing here if that's okay. I'm more than happy to hang on here. There, Kate, am, I, am I visible now? Yes, you are. I'm more than happy to, to linger for 15 minutes or more. Uh, to see what questions have come up or what comments people have, because I've been oblivious to those as the hour went by. Sure. Let's see here. Let me close this. We actually don't have that. Come on. I know you have questions out there. It's fine. <laughs> uh, just conversation. Yeah. Uh, if it's okay for folks to uh, unmute. That mm -hmm. would be I think so. Craig, Craig is going to stay um, a little bit longer. So, so why don't I just, you know, everyone here at Southwest Harbor Public Library, we really appreciate all of you coming out for this event. And and Craig, thank you so much for, you know, helping kindle the excitement for us all with as the birds coming more and more each day. So thank you. I so in the meantime. Um, those of you that would like to stay, and if any of you want to pop in and ask a direct question, um, why don't you just make a comment in the quest question and area, question and answer area, and just sort of say, you know, say that you'd like to ask a question and we'll, we'll, um, you know, feature your, your vocals. Thank you. One question I see about binoculars, um, there are some great places to go. You can call Maine Audubon or go to their store to get a sense of like the variety and the price points. Um, I like Nikon Monarchs and I'm not plugging for them. It's just a, it's just a, a pair, I, a model that I happen to know. Um, and there are many, many that I do not know and probably should recommend. 
Um, if this was about buying optics, I would have done that homework, but Nikon Monarchs are in a reasonable price point and they're really spectacular for um, the clarity and their weight. There's a question about slides from tonight's program. Would they be available? Uh, well, I know that you're archiving or recording the mm -hmm. session. Those will be available. And I'm fine if, if folks want to like take screenshots or reach out to me uh, and request uh, a particular graphic. I mean, again, many of the uh, visual images are not mine. Uh, the photographs uh, are borrowed from eBird and Cornell, but um, I'm happy to share anything that is of interest to folks. I'll go ahead and put your email again in the chat just so people have it again. Thank you, Kate. Sure. So uh, Reed has a question um, and shout out to Reed. He's the maker of those uh, of that Oriole feeder. Um, uh, climate change might be impacting the birds seen on MDI or in Maine in general. I think there's the general consensus that um, birds are simply fewer in number by quite a lot. So you might go out in your backyard and see in here a Perula warbler and um, a yellow warbler and a black throated green warbler, but you might uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you might have seen 12 and now you see three. Um, and so that to me is like an indication of a decline in overall volume and overall robustness of the population. Uh, compared to um, years past. But um, also there are birds who are more in trouble than others because of habitat loss uh, in their wintering ground and in their migration routes, as well as here in Maine. Um, so if they're declining generally, and then they get to a, a place where um, like blueberry barrens or meadows that get mowed um, that are not in sync with the, with the hatching season of, of the young, um, then the birds are, are challenged uh, even, even there. Um, so Maine, you know, and also birds are moving further north. I think there's, I've, I've seen some predictions that we will likely lose the boreal chickadee altogether to points north of Maine. Um, a boreal chickadee is quite scarce on MDI uh, to, to, to the vanishing point. They used to be here uh, probably 60s, 70s, and 80s, but, but really no longer except for um, a stray. But you'll see them in Washington County and Arista County and interior Maine, like Katahdin National, um, uh, Katahdin State Park area, but they're probably moving north as the climate warms. So there are birds whose ranges are coming into Maine, like the Carolina Wren, but there are also birds who are, whose ranges are kind of bumping north out of Maine. Um, can I share my favorite two spots if Laura is still on? Um, boy, you know, I, I would say one of my favorite spots, I'm, I'm biased by, by um, where I live in Southwest Harbor, but I spend a lot of time at Seawall, uh, not just looking out at sea, but walking the campground loops and um, Wonderland and, and Ship Harbor are great trails to, to walk, especially early morning before the summer hikers um, swarm the place. Um, Sir Demont is an incredible place in Acadia National Park over on the Bar Harbor side. Uh, Otter Cliffs can be great for birding, especially looking at uh, breeding guillemots and, um, and things like that. Um, so those are some of my favorites. Let's see. Oh, the Scooted Falls Sea Watch. Thank you, Ed and Deb. Um, so in the Hawk Watch on Cadillac. So this is a, a little bit later as summer turns into fall, but out on Scudic Peninsula, there's a park naturalist volunteer, uh, park naturalist, I don't think they're a volunteer. They spend every day watching seabirds fly by from north towards the south, sometimes in spectacular numbers. Uh, but you can get kind of a, a curated experience or, or a docent kind of an enriched experience at Scudic Point in the fall. And similarly, the Hawk Watch on Cadillac I don't know how the Hawk Watch intersects with the new um, ticket and fee routine that uh, is being imposed for the top of Cadillac, but it's a long-standing Hawk Watch for the fall that starts, I think, in mid-August uh, and has recorded some spectacular days. I'm scrolling through the Q&A here. I think when you say early morning, how early do you mean, <laughs> Marianne? Um, 
as early as you can get yourself out of bed, I think. Um, it's really kind of a question of um, getting up and out. It's not necessarily first light because sometimes it, it takes a little bit of time for the sun rays to hit um, the vegetation for birds like warblers to get fully active and for insects to begin flying. So I'd say 6.30 in, 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 in like May and June, I'd say 6.30 to nine is kind of prime time. Um, let's see. Here's a question about um, an osprey on the Mud Creek pole, uh, road pole late after the ospreys left um, and the nest had caught on fire. I actually didn't know that it caught on fire. I don't think it will impede their return. Ospreys are very good at nest building. They dive uh, on um, dying trees and, and grab branches and break them off uh, in mid flight and carry them to their nest site. Um, they grab twigs and branches from the ground and then, and then smaller material as the nest platform forms. But ospreys build nests from scratch uh, pretty routinely. It's a little bit easier when something's already there, but, um, but uh, they are, they're good at nest building. So I'm hoping they'll come back. Uh, when I bird the MDI high school ponds, where do I go besides around the ponds uh, into the woods or fields? I uh, tend to circle all three ponds, not just travel one side, Sue, and then um, I go back behind the ponds and back to the back edge of the uppermost playing field at, at the high school. And there's a Kittredge Brook Preserve there um, managed by Mancos Heritage Trust, I believe, that uh, has some great um, uh, forest walks. It's kind of an oak, uh, deciduous oak and, um, and birch forest with some um, conifers mixed in. And um, then you can get to some marsh edges as well. So you might see palm warblers as well as pine warblers. And uh, one caution about going deep back into those woods is that there has been a goshawk that breeds there in past years and they can be quite aggressive um, and uh, hazardous to your health <laughs> if you uh, get into their territory and they don't like seeing you there. So be mindful of that. Craig, Susan Buell had a question or an observation that on Seawall Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I honestly don't know about that, Susan. I mean, I drive that road a lot on my way to um, bird walks and exercise walks at Seawall uh, Campground and, and Seawall Picnic Area. I wonder about whether, um, I, do, I don't think the habitat is that dramatic, the habitat shift. I wonder actually about feeding uh, because I, I know there's at least one house on the uh, inland side of the seawall road that um, recruits deer and turkey and mallards. Uh, and I'm pretty convinced that there's some corn being spread out there every morning, uh, which brings those animals in. So I'd be, I'd be surprised if it was a habitat shift as much as it might be um, perhaps a good shelter, uh, you know, like good you know, place to, to hang out, but also uh, maybe uh, there's some artificial food feeding going on there too. All right, well, let's call it an evening. It's been lovely to be with you all. And um, I hope to see some of you in the field at some point. And I really do, uh, Kate put my email address in the uh, chat space. And I, I don't, I haven't found my limit for questions that come my way. Uh, if it's a bird question or an audio tape from your iPhone saying, what am I hearing? Um, or just an area of confusion or clarification, um, I haven't hit my capacity for tolerance there, so I'm happy to get any questions from any of you at any point. Um, that stuff lights me up, so bring it on. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Kate and Erich, do you want me to stay on or are we, uh, are we all set? Yeah, let's stay on just for a moment if you can. That'd be great. Yeah.